After the defeat of Scaith and our escape from Kubia, we start up our desktop to receive mail from Black Rose. She's confused about how everything would be solved since we got rid of the Red Wand. Checking on the boards, it appears that other players were also affected by our battle with Scaith. So much so that they heard a weird loud noise. Logging back into the Theta server, Black Rose waits for us to go explore the dungeon again where we first defeated Scaith. Upon arrival, the bracelet that once shined in the area has failed to do so this time. Entering the dungeon, Black Rose notices that the area has not changed, but exploring further, it seems that there are no enemies. Black Rose wonders that if there was something, could they succeed? Going deeper into the dungeon, we notice how scared Black Rose is. She tries to play it tough, but admits that she is scared. Kite admits as well that he is terrified, but no matter what, they will not stop. Kite begins to ask Black Rose why she is here, and before she can explain, Balmung appears. He is also here trying to find answers to what has happened. Not sure why Balmung is trying to find the answer, but maybe he too has his reasons. Heading to the room where we fought Scaith in, it appears that it is locked. We head back to town, which upon returning, we are met with the system admin. He found out that the item awarded to us during a power-up campaign had a defect, so they gave us a new item to replace it. However, while trying to activate it, it ends with the same results of an installation error. We receive a letter from Aura that reads, Fragment. System has divided me into segments. To limit me, I must merge to be born. Find the stolen fragment. Please, you are the only one I can count on. We also received an email from an anonymous user telling us that they have information to cure those who are in a coma and to meet them at this location. Heading to the location, we arrive in a large empty white room. A voice calls to us and it's our friend Black Rose. She also got an email to come to this area. While attempting to gate out, it seems to be impossible. All of a sudden, several system admins appear. He introduces himself as Leos. All the emails that we had received prior warning us to not get involved were all from Leos, and he blames the current problems happening to the world on us. Kite tries to defend himself and points out how Leos has done nothing but cover up the incidents involving the comatose victims. Leos continues to blame hackers for the situation and pushes all the issues on them. Black Rose is now angry after what Leos has said and tries to use his logic against him that if she were to blame someone that all of those currently in a coma would suddenly return to normal. Black Rose mentions someone named Kazu. Is this who Black Rose is fighting for? Leos tries to defuse the situation by mentioning that they are investigating the matter of those who have been comatose and how it's related to the world and are working on countermeasures. To prevent further issues, they want Kite to delete their character. Kite asks for the reason. Leos mentions how Kite's character is against the user agreement and has an illegal effect on their character. Before Leos can force deletion of Kite's character, Helba shows up. Helba threatens Leos with the notion that he will also be one of the lost ones. Helba, aware of Kite's power, suggests that Kite could just use Data Drain on Leos. Kite denies ever thinking of using Data Drain on someone. Helba, aware of this, compares him to Leos, who is almost trigger happy at the thought of deleting Kite's character without even realizing how Kite's bracelet even works, or if he even has the power to remove Kite's character while he wields the bracelet. Helba informs Leos that Kite's data is so protected that not even the system admins can crack it. Helba also educates Kite that the Power Up campaign item given to them are actually vaccines in disguise as rare items in an attempt to delete his character. Kite chimes in and mentions that they don't care what happens to their character data and all they want to do is help their friend. Kite then asks Helba and Leos for advice on what they should do. Sadly, Helba and Leos don't have an answer for Kite. Helba brings up the poem, The Epitaph of Twilight, and that if the world was based off of the poem, then perhaps the poem will have a clue for them. Leos rejects this idea, but Helba informs Leos that the name Leos, which is a code name given to a system administrator, is the name of the King of Light, Leos, from the poem. Leos is unaware of this detail about his given name. Helba gives Leos the idea of watching over Kite and Black Rose for a little bit. The problem is spread so far in the world that if the issue escalates, could Leos accept the responsibility? Leos, backed into a corner, decides to retreat his previous plan and will give his new decision later when he is ready. 
Leos and Helba gate out. Kite and Black Rose don't have enough information to go on besides the poem. Black Rose about to tell us something decides to save it later and gates out. Leo sends us mail, giving us his conclusion. He will approve of our actions if we follow one condition, that being we follow his orders from now on. He gives us the names of all five servers in the world, Delta, Theta, Lambda, Sigma, and Omega. He mentions that the server restrictions for Lambda have been lifted, and we may now access that root town, and he'll be waiting for us as the weapon shop NPC. Heading to the weapon shop on the Lambda server, Leos waits for us with instructions. He wants us to investigate the infection rate on the server, and protected areas are top priority. He gives us a virus core needed to access the protected areas. He informs us that the protected area was listed on the board, so we can go to the board and acquire the keywords. Logging back into the world, we are greeted by Elk and Mia. However, it seems that Mia is in need of help. Apparently, ever since Skate's defeat, her input system has been acting up. Elk and Mia are also heading to that protected area for some aromatic grass. Making our way through the dungeon to the boss room, we encounter a data bug. We data drain the bug and learn a new ability, Drain Arc. Elk gives Mia the aromatic grass, which appears to have cured her. We ask how we use the aromatic grass, but it has no actual use. They just collect the item. Mia goes on about how futility is a necessity and a system without it is vulnerable. The key to opening a new gate is futility. Just because there is no use for something, does that make it futile? Sometimes the existence of something is enough. Logging back into the root town, everything seems fine until Mia talks again, which seems that she is not cured. Thinking back to the forum post, we should have seen a girl-like character, but during that encounter, we did not see her. We see a board post talking about a trading convention. Once we arrive at the dungeon, we see five players. One player, by the name of Rachel, explains the trading situation. Everyone wants a certain item, however, one item is missing from the trade, so we help out and explore the dungeon. While exploring the dungeon, we run into a mysterious dual blade player named Moonstone, and before anything can be said, they log out. We continue exploring the dungeon and make our way to the treasure room. We take the item, the love archery, back and assist with the trade. After all the trades have completed, Rachel thanks us and gives us her member address. Examining the boards, we see a post about a show from a player known as Nuke Usagi Maru, and if you intend to watch, you must come alone. Once we arrive in the dungeon, everyone who came to watch has become impatient. Nuke starts the show and immediately starts bombing his performance, causing those who have come to watch him to now suddenly leave. Nuke, surprised that we are the only one left, decides that the show must go on. His performance will be in the lowest part of the dungeon. While making our way down, we come across Moonstone again, and again he logs out before anything can be said. Finally, we reach the room with Nuke, and he is battling the boss by himself. We assist him in fighting the boss, unsure if he needs the help or not, but after defeating the boss, he seems thankful that we help and he gives us his member address as gratitude. Hacking another gate from a protected area found on the board, we enter the dungeon and make it to the boss room. We see an odd player whose character appearance seems incomplete. A data bug appears and attacks the incomplete character, so we attack the data bug and data drain it. After defeating the monster, the player talks in an odd manner saying things like, why are you in the way? Are you Mr. In the way? Hello? Do you have end? I want end. Someone give me end. The unknown player logs out and we are left more confused than ever. Perhaps Leos has some answers for what just happened. Reporting back to the root town, Leos waits for our status report. We inform him that the infection is spreading. Also, there was a player who was attacked and we defeated the data bug. After saying it, we realized there was another player in a protected area, which shouldn't be the case. Leos tells us that they are probably failed data, and that they are immune to the protection. So the player we saw wasn't actually a player, but rather just meaningless data. Leos will do some investigating, and will inform us of our next order. In the meantime, we join Gardenia in exploring a dungeon she sent us in our mail. We sense that there might be something here. While exploring, we decide to ask Gardenia if she likes flowers. Previously, when she asked us to join her in a dungeon, she picked a field with a flower name and was talking about flowers. Unwilling to open up, she asks if she must explain, which we respond with only if you'd like, which she follows up with, well then don't bother asking. Again, we run into Moonstone, but this time he was able to at least say something, even though all he said this time was, ah, before logging out. Reaching the boss room, Gardenia warns us that this room has an extremely powerful monster and to be careful. Defeating the monster, we receive the item Crystal Stone, and Gardenia seems annoyed, saying, I feel cheated when I don't receive equipment from the treasure boxes. Use that as you wish. We ask Gardenia if she is looking for something, and she tells us that she is looking for revenge on a monster that got her before. So, mission accomplished. We receive mail from Black Rose, wondering if we are just being used by Leos, and if we're doing the right thing. 
which we respond with, let's obey for now. That might be true, but since we don't have enough information, let's see what happens. We also get mail from Moonstone asking for our assistance. Logging in, Black Rose waits for us and hands us a data core, which she was instructed to give to us from Leos. We head out with Moonstone, whose objective is to defeat all monsters within the dungeon. After completing the objective, Moonstone logs out, and we wonder if Moonstone was satisfied. Later, we investigate an area that Leos has requested us check the data pollution, and upon arrival, we hear the noise. Entering the dungeon, we encounter an odd creature. We go to attack it, and it seems unfazed. Then it runs away. Exploring further, we run into the creature again, and we attack it again with the same results. Black Rose thinks that it's just playing with us. Entering the boss room, we are able to identify the creature. It once was Scathe, now it is Enos, the Mirage of Deceit. This fight plays out similar with Scathe, minus the red wand that it hits with, plus a few new moves, and it has a magic tolerance, so physical attacks are required. It can still do an earthquake attack, hitting all team members close to the impact zone. It also has the moves Absolute Zero, Thunder Trance, and Demon Fire, which are all similar, which launches an elemental shard towards all party members. Invisible Doll, which creates monsters that it then uses to launch at the party. Vision of Self, which causes a debuff on a party member. And lastly, Data Drain, which causes a mass amount of debuffs on a single party member. Once you are able to data drain Enos, it resembles the glowing rocks like before, but instead of a humanoid structure, it seems more like a random assortment. Once defeated, it will crumble to pieces, and you will make your return to town. However, upon arriving in town, it seems that it is entirely empty. Making our way through town, we meet up with Leos. He says they had to force a system shutdown due to a critical issue. Upset by the situation, he instructs us to not move until given further instructions. Logging off for the day, we have to assume that maybe Balmung was right about us and that we are the ones causing the problems. The power it holds can bring for either salvation or destruction. Which way are we heading? We wondered what Yasuhiko would do. Checking our mail, we have a message from Black Rose, telling us that she is tired of being ordered around and we will move on our own accord. We also get a message from Aura, saying, Please come. You are my last hope. You are the only one that can merge me. Come to the dungeon, my segment. Be wary of Kubia. Logging back into the world, we are met with Mistral. She notices that everyone in town is acting weird, so it's nice to see a familiar face. She asks if we we have a second to talk, and we let her know we are on our way to a dungeon, and she eagerly tells us that she really, really, really wants to go with us. Checking around town before we head out, we notice that everyone, instead of running around and checking on shops, are now just standing still. You can't even trade with them. Making our way through the dungeon, we have a chat with Mistral. She's impressed with how strong we are, and is wondering if we're trying to be the strongest player. She tells us her goal is to collect every item. We explain the situation to Mistral, however, she thinks that we are just role-playing with the back story. Exploring further, we suddenly stop when we feel a strange presence, and suddenly, a glowing red orb appears out of Kite. It appears to be a fragment of Aura. Mistral is in disbelief, realizes the story that we told her is true. She notices that something is off about Aura, and how she isn't alive. Our bracelet begins to glow and pulses in rhythm with Aura, but before anything can happen, we start to hear the noise, and the ground begins to shake. We are suddenly brought to a strange area with a glowing floor. From above, we see blue roots roots, and again, we meet with Kubia. This fight is different from the others. We are fighting the core of Kubia, which will alternate between magical and physical tolerance. There are other monsters that appear similar to Kubia's core, like Kill Gamora, Downer Gamora, Various Gamora, and Repth Gamora. After a while, the core will disappear, and Kubia will attack with Legion's Reach, which will cause roots to rise up and hit all party members. Arc Bullet, which Kubia will spit out a burst of energy hitting all party members, and Megiddo Flame, which summons fireballs from the sides of Kubia's neck that hits the party twice. After defeating Kubia's core, it starts to spit out a purple smoke and falls from the sky defeated. With its last bit of energy, it escapes into a portal. Helba arrives and is impressed with our victory over Kubia. She tells us that we must release Aura. We ask if that will help our comatose friend but she is unsure if it will. We return to town, and Mistral apologizes for making light of the story that we told her earlier. She believes in us, and knows that we are doing our best. She will help out in any way that she can, and proceeds to log out to go shopping. Logging out, we visit the boards, and we see a thread addressed directly to us, 
from a player called Marlo. The message reads, To Kite, I want to talk with you. I guess you're pretty famous these days, but I know that guys like you are just a fluke. If you think I'm wrong, then come to the dungeon by yourself. By yourself, I mean it. So we log back in and try to meet Marlo in the dungeon. However, upon entering, we see that Marlo is being confronted by two players, telling him that his post on the board isn't proper online etiquette. Marlo tells them that they were just trying to get our attention, but the two players insist that he was coming off rude. Marlo shrugs them off and proceeds to head to the bottom area of the dungeon. Entering the boss room, Marlo seems to not want any assistance. We help him anyways, and after defeating the boss, he comes off a bit annoyed that we helped him. We introduce ourselves and ask what it was that he wanted to talk about. Surprised that anyone even showed up, he thinks about what the post was even about and can't remember and asks to meet up again another time, but gives us his member address. Sandro invites us to a dungeon to acquire a rumored greatsword. We successfully make it into the treasure room. Sanjiro is excited by the sword and we gladly give it to him. In return, he gives us a rare weapon as thanks for assisting him. Natsume messages us that she will be 10 times stronger. Not sure how she plans to do that, but by looking further into the boards, Someone made a post about defeating a monster called Level 10 Vine that will increase your character's level 10 times. This must be what Natsume is referring to. So we make our way through the dungeon and see that she's fighting the boss by herself. But it's not the Level 10 Vine like the post mentioned, but just a normal Hackberry King monster. Defeating the monster, Natsume tells us she went all through the dungeon and can't find the monster mentioned in the post. Perhaps it was just a hoax. Natsume tells us that she will become stronger. Looking at our mailbox, we have a message from Piros. He located Mia and wants to get revenge for turning him a different color from before. We find Mia and confront her. Piros sarcastically thanks Mia for the gift, and Mia seems to have forgotten who Piros is, which only makes him even more mad. She was just joking about not knowing who he was before and rubs salt in his wounds, saying it was fun having a new color. Piros obviously not happy with being tricked into taking an item that altered his appearance. Mia apologizes, thinking it was all just fun and games. Piros accepts Mia's apology, and Mia asks if Piros has ever heard of a rare item. He is aware of the rare item, and says that only seven exist throughout the entire game. She offers the item to Piros as an apology gift. Piros is over the moon with excitement, and says that he has nothing to forgive since he wasn't even mad to begin with. Mia telling Piros to put the item on a little too eagerly. We warn Piros that maybe he shouldn't equip the item, but it is already too late. Piros has changed colors once again, and his dialogue isn't legible, but he doesn't have very nice things to say to Mia and logs out. We tell Mia that her games are going a bit too far. She assures us that his color change will be temporary, and he'll be back to normal once he logs off the game. We ask why she's been picking on Piros, and her response is simply, I don't know. We think we understand, but then again, I don't think we entirely get it. A message from Black Rose informs us that the board is back up and that we should check it out. We see a post regarding the Epitaph of Twilight. Someone mentions that it is a story about people searching for the Twilight Dragon that will save the world from being destroyed by the Abominable Wave. Logging into the game, Black Rose waits near the entrance to town. She tells us that she messaged the author of the post, and she is waiting on a reply from them. In the meantime, we head to the board and see a post from someone by the name of Bear, and replies from another player by the name of Mimiru. Now these characters are actually from the show Dot Hack Sign, and are some of the main protagonists from which the anime takes place before the events of the game Dot Hack Infection. The thread says that Bear would like to meet up after a while of not logging in. Mimiru asks where he would like to meet up, and he responds with the field where she first met him, him being Tsukasa. Entering the dungeon, we meet a player named A20, another character introduced in the anime Dot Hack Sign. She asks if we know about the Golden Grunty. She tells us that she is collecting them, even though they are really ugly items. She barely managed to make it into the dungeon trying to fight or avoid the strong monsters in the field, and she can't go any further ahead by herself. Ultimately, she cuts her losses and logs out. Reaching the treasure room, we are approached by someone which turns out to be Mimiru. She is intrigued by the color of our character, since she hasn't seen anyone with one like it before. She tells us that she is meeting up with a friend, and after saying that, she receives a message from them telling her that the meetup location has changed. Before heading out, she gives us a gift, and the gift is her sword. We get mail from Linda, informing us that Bao Meng is looking over a strange room he found and gives us the location. The area is protected, so we hack the gate and make our way through the dungeon to a room with a plethora of bird cages, all left open or torn apart. 
A voice calls out saying, when the finger points to the yonder moon, the fool will not look at the fingertip. And we receive the item, Epitaph 01. Belmung appears and is shocked by our presence. We tell him we aren't going to argue with him and ask him to tell us what is lurking within the world. Annoyed, he tells us that it doesn't concern us. But we refute his claim and tell him that it does concern us. Belmung of the Azure Sky, Orca of the Azure Sea, aren't your goals the same? Isn't there some connection between Aura and the disaster? Without answering any of our questions, he tells us not to meddle any further and doesn't want us to get involved and proceeds to log out. We receive a message from Black Rose regarding the response that she was waiting for from the user 01. The reply tells us that they only posted what they know and everything they know all came from the player known as Wise Man. They give us the location where to find Wise Man. We also get a message from Leos, urging us to stand by, that our actions have caused more work for him, so as to not expand his workload anymore. But we cannot stand by, so we go meet up with Wise Man. We see he is doing business with other players. After his previous business ends, he asks if we would like to trade as well. We ask about the Epitaph of Twilight. He tells us that the information about it won't be cheap, and he'll only tell us under one condition. But he'll need more time to give us details, so we expect to hear from him through mail. Checking our mail, he sends us his demand for the trade. We must acquire a spark sword from a dungeon. We head to the gate and the area turns out to be protected, so we hack it and get in. We fight the data bug monster, data drain it, and defeat it. After defeating the monster, we receive the spark sword. Wise Man is probably still in the last location we saw him at, so we log out and head back to town. Upon arrival, we see Balmung and Leos talking to each other. We don't hear the entire conversation, but Leos tells Balmung to give something to, and then they both proceed to log out. We head back to the dungeon Wise Man was conducting his business in before, and we give him the spark sword. Black Rose and Wise Man go back and forth, and then Wise Man brings up that the area was protected. Black Rose is infuriated. He chose a protected area to test us. Had it been any other player, they would have not been able to grant his request. Wise Man asks us who we are, so we tell him everything we know. He seems very interested in the events that have occurred in the world. He tells us that he will assist us and apologizes for testing us. He proceeds to give us his member address and tells us that he will send us the data that he has on the Epitaph of Twilight in our mailbox. He also proceeds to return the Spark Sword to us. A very confused Black Rose can only mutter the word what? And Wise Man tells us that our tale was more interesting than the item. Checking our mail, we get a message from Wise Man and it reads, Promise stanza in the Epitaph, unknown where the cursed wave was born. After the stars doth cross the heavens, the sky in the east doth darken and air doth fill with morning. From the chosen land beyond the forest, a sign of the wave comes. Riding the wave is Scathe, the shadow of death, to drown all that stands. Mirage of deceit, Enos, betray all with the flawed image, and did aid the wave. By the power of Magus, a drop from the wave doth reach the heavens and creates a new wave. With the wave, Fidchil, the power to tell dark future, hope darkens, sadness and despair rules. Gore schemes when swallowed by the cursed wave. Maha seduces with the sweet trap. Wave reaches the pinnacle and escape none can. Tarvos still remains with more cruelty to punish and destroy, and with the turbulent destruction, after the wave only a void remains. And from the deep within the void arrives, Corbinic. Perhaps then the wave is just a beginning as well. He concludes, saying that the monster Scathe and Enos must be the monsters we encountered, and that we should contact the legendary hacker Helba. She is located in the net slums, and gives us a spell to reach it. East, north, south, west, north. Gates to paradise will open, and he says, May the grace of the Twilight Dragon be with you. Black Rose asks if we might have any idea what the net slums Wise Man is referring to. Additionally, we get messages from all of our other companions. Black Rose tells us that we need to call her every time we enter the world. Mistral tells us not to just play and study all the time, but to also fall in love. Pyros talks about how well we work as a team. Sandro tells us to call him anytime, and the title of his message is Yojimbo 2, which is a reference to the movie by the same name, which is the Japanese word for bodyguard. He's a big fan of of old Japanese films. Gardenia tells us that she thinks that we are a good person and she does not dislike us. Natsume, who seems to lack self-confidence, asks if she's useful or is in the way and she says that she will try a lot harder. Moonstone, short and sweet, just says he's glad to work with us. Marlo contradicts himself by telling us to buy him a drink for dragging him around with us and then says that he hates when people buy him drinks. Rachel
Rachel calls us her business partner and wants to make big bucks. And finally, Nuke says that an adventure with him must be filled with thrills and gags. Before logging back on, we check the boards and see someone has commented on the thread we saw last game about Aura, but instead it's about a strange guy talking about the net slums along with the dungeon he is found in. Logging back into the game, we see Black Rose also logging in. She repeats the field name we just read on the board. We will head here to find any information we can about the net slums. We reach the area the strange guy is located in. They are asking if we know where the area he is looking for is at. Obviously, we don't know what they are looking for, and it seems like they themselves don't know what they are looking for either. After they ramble on, they finally mention a rendezvous point at Pulsating Worst Core, which seems to be where the net slums is located. They continue to ramble on and on, and then suddenly, Leo appears and erases the character right in front of us. We ask what it is he's doing, and he tells us that he's doing his job of debugging and deleting worthless data. He reminds us that he told us to stay put until told otherwise. He threatens to delete our characters if we fail to obey his orders. We return to the root town, and here, Balmung waits for us. He gives us a data core and tells us to use it, and then proceeds to log out. We use the data core to hack the gate to the net slums. Upon Upon reaching the area, Black Rose says the spell Wise Man told us to use to reach the net slums. Nothing happens, and we giggle, which agitates Black Rose. Entering the dungeon, Black Rose repeats the spell, and again nothing happens. Black Rose has had enough, and leaves it to us to figure it out. The spell Wise Man told us about is actually the path we must take. Not following the directions will put us back into the first room. So going east, north, south, west, and then north again takes us deeper into the dungeon. Reaching the boss room takes us to an empty white room with a single toady temple gate. We assume it's a dead end, even though it feels so strange. We are all of a sudden taken from the temple gate into the area that looks like something that we saw back in the first game, where the book merged with us. A city that appears in an apocalyptic state with character avatars that are not from the same mold all other players share. Black Rose is freaked out by the appearance of the area and the characters. We must be in the net slum. A player tells us that they think of the net slums as a paradise. We decide to talk to the players in the slums to see if they know where Helba is. One of them tells us that the gate cannot be used unless acknowledged by Helba. The other players don't seem to have the answer we are looking for. So we explore the net slums, and after a while, another player appears and asks if we are looking for Helba. He tells us that he had heard from her recently regarding the Epitaph of Twilight, and to sum it up that it is just a tale, a saga that recounts how the Age of the Spirits came to an end. He proceeds to tell us that the texts are scattered and difficult to comprehend. Black Rose asks a question that has been bothering her about how all the players look different than all of the other players of the game. He tells us that the net slums is where all of the unsuccessful non-player characters drifted to as a sanctuary. Then players joined in with their own creations and it's become indistinct on who is a player and who is an NPC. And then there are those who have lost their bodies on the outside world, which are now mere memories, a faded reminder of who they once were. All that remains is their character data, which now wanders the network. This reminds him of Harold and how he shared the same fate. A voice calls out, I must speak with Morgana to go where she is. The living flesh poses a hindrance, but I must, I must go for our aura. Emma, please give me a little more courage. And then Helba appears. These were the words of the creator of this world, Harold Hewick. She then gives us Harold's notes. She is also aware that we have been seeking her. We tell her everything up to this point, and she tells us that we have both succeeded in reaching the epitaph of twilight. Suddenly, we are met with an unexpected guest. It is Balmung. It seems he is on the side of Leo for someone who seemed to work alone. Balmung, who used us to get to the net slums, and Helba lets him know that this type of behavior is disgraceful for someone of his status within the game. We are upset by Balmung's actions, and he tells us that it was the only way to restore order. Helba, confused by Balmung's statement, educates him that there is an order that the world desires, and then the order that he desires, and then asks which form it should take. Leos interrupts and says that it should take the form that he desires. Leos appears again, 
with all of his forms like before when he tried to delete our character. Helba seems unsurprised by Leos' appearance and almost expected him to arrive. Leos tells Helba that those in the net slums are threats to the world and attempts to delete all users in the area. But right before he can do so, an ominous presence appears. Helba tells Leos that it must be her doing and she doesn't care for us. Unsure who Helba is referring to, she tells us that it is the world itself. The net slums begin to shake and a large gust of wind starts to blow everyone back. Leos, Balmung, and Helba retreat. Below us, the ground begins to shift and change into the same area that we once fought both Skeeth and Enos. Black Rose notices something resembling a leaf. However, it is not a leaf but rather the next phase of Enos, Magus the Propagation. In this fight, Magus will roam around, striking the top of his head on the ground, causing an earthquake similar to both Skeeth and Enos. It will also shed its petals as it roams around. These will explode and deal damage when Magus releases his attack called Death and Rebirth, which will deal damage based off of the number of petals remaining on the field. Once all of its petals are gone, Magus will sit still and regrow them. Additionally, Magus will Will occasionally cast sleep on your teammates, so be sure to keep an eye on them. Another move Magus will use is called Light of Purity, shooting lasers from on high down on the team below, dealing roughly half of your health. Lastly, like all other phases, it can use Data Drain, causing massive debuffs onto a target party member. Once weakened enough, you can use Data Drain on Magus, reducing it down to its stone-like structure. In its stone form, Magus will only attack with Earthquake, or by using a wood-based magic attack that will strike a teammate multiple times for massive damage. Even Black Rose, with full HP, cannot withstand the attack. Once you have defeated Magus, it will break down like all of the other times before. After being defeated, the field returns back into the net slums. However, the net slums seems to be falling apart, or rather, rising apart, as parts of the net slum begin to ascend into the sky. We make our way back to town, but when we arrive, we see that the root town has been altered, now resembling that of all the virus data bug fields that we had explored prior. Are we doing the right thing? Have we caused more damage? than good by fighting these creatures. In disbelief, Black Rose can't even muster up the strength to hold on to her sword. Maybe this was a turning point. The relationship between me and the game The World has gone beyond pure amusement, and it was spreading beyond the network. We receive another message from Bandai about a reverse city in the sky, reaching the area Bandai has told us about, and while here, we are facing off against a massive boss monster. Unlike the last super boss, this one doesn't have any resistances. This monster is no joke when it comes to hitting multiple times with its four arms all with blades. It will hit several times doing enough damage to cause you to heal mid-combo just to keep the party member alive. Once weak enough, you may data drain the monster and get a rare dual blade weapon for Kite. After the fight, Kite wonders if this was the creature that destroyed the city. Additionally, in .hack Mutation, a small section of the game, which is not mentioned in any board post or mail message, is something that takes place back at the Delta server. By visiting the hidden forbidden holy ground again, we are given scenes from the anime .hack sign. We can visit this area four times to receive special items and cutscenes from the anime. The first scene is when Tsukasa shows Mimiru and Bear his guardian. After the scene ends, Kite has a feeling they've met before. The second visit is when Sora tries to get BT's member address, and when she refuses, he defeats her character. We wonder if perhaps this is a player's memory that was left behind in the world. The third visit has Bear, Mimiru, Silver Knight, BT, and Subaru discussing Tsukasa's actions in the world and how it might be possible that all the trouble Tsukasa is causing might not actually be his doing, but rather someone else's. Again, the visions fade, and we wonder what the players are doing now. Upon the final visit, we see Krim, Tsukasa, and Sora. Sora fights Krim, which will allow Tsukasa to escape. If you made it to the end of the video, make sure you like and subscribe since it helps out the channel a lot. If you want to see any more .hack content, I've made a playlist with all of the content in chronological order. Until next time, have a great day and take care.